The human brain, as you may have guessed through your travels in life, is a massively important piece of organic machinery that does things like produce anxiety and makes you wonder if you really lock the front door or not. But believe it or not, apart from making you overthink and zone out during critical time periods, it has other functions. I know, wild, right? There are many areas of the brain that are necessary and should their physical structuring be altered or communication be disrupted, it can have cascading consequences on a person's ability to interact in a pro-social way, move their bodies, or in general just control themselves. In the events of mom and dad, there is a massive heap of neurological damage going around for specifically parents. It is well known the brain structure, from what we can tell, is altered in some form or another with gray matter increasing in several key areas to facilitate a parent keeping their offspring alive and away from dangers and other areas where gray matter is actually interestingly enough decreased for one reason or another. Under normal conditions, these help our species thrive through the collective efforts of two parents. But should this process be changed, brain tissue reorganized, or in general the regard the parent has for their offspring altered, it can raise several issues. So in today's episode, let's discuss the neurological changes forced upon those who have reproduced as well as what is actually happening within this just chef's kiss Nick Cage movie. Motherfuckers! You're going to open this motherfucking door! Uh, is it organic or is it something more? Let's discuss. Have you looked outside as of late? It matters very little where you are right now. It's probably either cold, snowing, or where I am, raining like the ocean lives above us. With that, winter is the perfect time to cozy up at home with a mobile game that you can really get stuck into. Not only is it available on your phone, but also on your computer as well. What makes it better is you can seamlessly switch between mobile and PC. In this game, there are over 800 incredible champions, ranging from lizard-like creatures to elves to orcs to dwarves to demons, each looking pretty cool. This December is the perfect time to jump in and revel in the festive spirit with Raid Shadow Legends, which is today's sponsor. The Yuletide event is here, and what they're running is a special promotion where players can embark on holiday adventures and complete a host of different minigames. These are going to give you a chance to win both in-game prizes and real-life prizes as well. All you need to do is download Raid Shadow Legends using the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen, copy your in-game player ID, and then venture over to raidxmas.plarium.com from December 15th to January 10th. From here, enter your ID and settle in for a tale most festive following the brave Sir Nicholas across the Red Spike Mountains. There will be various minigames, each giving you a chance to win in-game prizes and real-life goodies ranging from the epic and legendary champions to even Amazon gift cards. And even if you are an existing player, you can still join in the festive fun by heading to RaidXmas.com where you can find a special promo code that everyone can redeem and earn a small in-game gift. Along with the holiday season upon us, the Cursed City just dropped, featuring the Doom Tower with 100 stages to complete with bosses to be conquered, and various quests to help you get your hands on a mythical champion. There's a lot to do this holiday season, so if you haven't started playing yet, then what are you waiting for? Click the link in my description or scan the QR code to get insane bonuses available only via my link. You'll get two epic champions with my link, not one, but two at once. First is Lightsworn, a very strong epic champion from the Sacred Order. His kit allows you to keep a team alive with an increased defense buff and a revive on death skill. And the second is Epic Juliana, after reaching level 15 an epic champion and a boss killer for the Sacred Order. She is an attack type warrior wielding the magic affinity, thus very powerful against enemies with affinity. Once you're in and crushing your enemies, come find me under the name Roanoke, join my clan, Croatoan, and we'll be legends together. So just hit my link in the description and I'll see you on the battlefield. So we kick off our story today as Static on an Infotainment Center plays in a minivan. One of the things we'll see throughout this is the exact situation playing out over and over again, which leads me to believe there is a physical alteration to the brain tissues in key areas, but we will get there a little later on. A parent leaves their offspring in the car while they get off at the train tracks as a minivan gets annihilated. Oof. I mean, that's kind of what you get for driving a minivan. Third Gen Forerunner gang rise up. Half as safe and twice as cramped. We die like a real family in here. Also, once again, imagine saying oof and, uh, wow, oh God, it's almost 2024. So as we meet Carly and Damon, Damon is biking to his PSATs, or PSATs as they're called, as Damon remarks that this will set the tone for the rest of his life. Wait, the preliminary scholastic aptitude test? If I recall, and it's been a hot minute, so uh, I may be wrong here, but isn't that just the practice version? They kind of just tell you if you're on the right track, but as far as I remember, that doesn't mean that you're like gonna get into a school with those. I could be wrong, like I said, it's been a while. So they decide that they'll celebrate that night as Carly then throws an entire toy down at her brother who's just running down the stairs. Yes, yeah, seems like a very standard and normal reaction given the circumstances. Very good. 
So as mom then drinks her coffee, we have World War Z breakfast with the family, except it doesn't look like a Hallmark movie where everyone loves each other, and surely nothing bad will happen later. They really just hate one another. You know, like a real red-blooded American family. USA, baby. So as they watch the lovely news about the offspring from earlier getting absolutely shrecked by the train, the police are unable to confirm if the adult was actually the parent or not, as they're acting well outside what would be expected to be at least normal. Also, I am truly jealous the mom has coffee right now. I forgot to buy coffee filters, and I'm just absolutely raw-dogging life right now, completely unaltered by the sweet, sweet release of caffeine. I cannot be held accountable for what I might say. I'm simply life-maxing at this point. So as Brent says Carly won't see Damon, she resists as he responds, well, he's a junior and you're a sophomore, so he's more experienced. And I don't know about y'all, but back in the day, the Stone Age, when I was a junior, I don't feel like I had a grasp on anything uh, more than any other person who was in like a grade below me. I was just white knuckling hormones the entire time and sweating around girls because my body was an idiot. The dad then says to his son to take his advice and never have kids. Eh, now that I'm in my 30s, I can totally see myself having kids, but I reckon that's a little further down the road than I initially imagined. Guess there's still time to have some fun in the meantime. Heading off to school, Carly stole money from her mom, as one does, as her mom tries to have a conversation with her. Carly is being angsty about it and says, oh, mom, I have other friends besides you. I mean, sure, but if your parent actually cares about you, uh, maybe don't be a complete clown to them. <laughs> Meanwhile, Josh starts crawling around as he gets yeeted onto the couch, and we get this weird electronic music just absolutely lost in the sauce. This is what robots talk like. And then Brent does this weird finger thing like a spider. Good lord, make it stop. Josh then throws a soccer ball at his dad as he turns around looking like he's wanting to absolutely Abraham his son, but instead, he breaks out of it smiling and walking off. But for that split second there, it does denote something is happening internally within the deeper areas of his brain, he's just not aware of it yet. Neurologically speaking, we can see the first presentation of symptoms of this presumed disease, although I believe it to be a combination event in reality. Now, it could just be Nick Cage's acting, because all I can ever think of with this man is not the bees. NOT THE BEES! Ah! But the look on his face would indicate a deep-seated growing potential anger. We will see this expressed later, but in this moment, he's still able to override it, or at least his emotional control center of his brain, specifically using the prefrontal cortex. However, as the infection takes deeper control, or at least presumed infection, I believe this area of the brain will experience some damage to it, or at least decrease in ability to function. And it's interesting, as there's already some issues with the brain once you have offspring. If you are aware, your physical brain structure will change upon reproducing. This is not only true in females, but in males as well. Only 6% of the mammalian species, which humans are a part of, will actually engage in the parental rearing of their young that they produce. Most males of the mammalian branch nope out of there and then let the mother deal with it. Truly not Chad-like at all. Never abandon your offspring. 94% of mammals stay getting dunked on by humanity on a near constant basis. Anyhow, pro-humanism aside, Areas of the brain that are most significantly impacted by the addition of a 50% smaller U are areas that show a reduction in gray matter in the orbitofrontal cortex. This is basically just behind and right above your eyes. There are also going to be increases in gray matter in the hypothalamus and amygdala. Interesting to say the least because the orbital frontal cortex function is literally known to hold functions such as social behavior and emotional appraisal among the encoding of value to things and people. Basically, understanding how important something is. The amygdala, conversely, has some of the opposite functions depending on how you view it, such as fear, anger, and a general pro-emotion control. Like, it does not give you really emotional control. It's where your emotions kind of come from, at least the ones we consider bad. Although, to be honest with you, emotions exist for a reason. They're not really bad or good. It's just how you use them. So if you want to break it down to its most basic idea, it's important that a parent acts this way, and this is why these changes happen. When single and looking for a mate, the area of your brain that needs most attention is the frontal lobe, specifically in this context, the orbital frontal cortex, as this helps you remain social and operating at a higher capacity to socialize, which I hear the ladies love. My ability to socialize has definitely decreased over the years, but uh, we're gonna need some gray matter there stat. You know, they like when you aren't completely horrible at talking to them. However, after having some prodigies, socialization is no longer the focus. Instead, keeping them alive is now your main purpose. I know you might not like it, but that's what you, that's your function. I'm sorry, it's just biology. So this is intrinsically linked to our species functioning, and it becomes the main and most important goal. To this end, 
This is why parents always talk about how they didn't know fear until they reproduced. This is also why parents say they kind of chilled out, but that's kind of more hormonal. We'll get there in a second. But the gray matter in this area associated with fear is literally increased. And this is also why parents tend to potentially socialize less. But even this may be beneficial because you never really know what another person is going to be like or how they will behave. Inviting people openly because you want to socialize that you may not know may cause your offspring to be put into dangerous situations. The brain may be mitigating these issues by decreasing the ability to socialize. And good lord, the brain is such an interesting organ because of this. These things happen not only, like, it's not really because of conscious thought, but your body responding to external stimuli. For the mother, it's clear why this is happening, but to see similar changes in the paternal side truly does show how important it is to choose your partner wisely when it comes to reproducing, as structural, physical changes to the brain are going to take place, whether you like it or not. So as Brent walks outside, absolutely nobody is out there, which is a little strange. Brent then looks at his reflection as he has memories back to when he was younger with a woman. And I mean, yeah, I reckon it can be that way. I still remember spring break of 2012. The personal records that were set then have never been touched by me since. What do you call them? Three days? Good times. Anyhow, over at the school, we meet Riley, who's not really all that important, but she's listening to music in class and swaying her head to it, uh, like kind of like the teacher wouldn't notice. Okay, then good luck with that. See, when you're that age, the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed, leading to more emotional decisions to be made, and also for you to be less concerned with the outcomes of your decisions. Hence why everyone around that age believes themselves to be immortal and invincible, and nothing bad can ever happen to them. So I'm not 100% sure why Josh isn't at school at this point, if his sister is, but the maid is starting to have some weird internal feelings as she stares out the window. And this is very similar to what's happening with Brent earlier. These could very well be mini seizures of sorts. Not to freak you out or anything, but seizures can present themselves in several different ways. A lot of people believe that seizures have to be like these full-scale shaking and convulsing events, but it's not really true. Known as a petite mal seizure, they are colloquially known as absent seizures. These seizures will cause you to go blank and kind of like stare out in the space for a few seconds, but then come back around again. Now something to remember is, zoning out doesn't mean you're having a seizure. I know people nowadays love to self-diagnose everything as odd and obscure for some reason that can make them special, but in this case it denotes functional alteration to the brain as consciousness becomes broken. The person is not aware that they had a seizure as the neurons in their brain begin firing in odd patterns or neurological death in some tissue is taking place. There are typically no known long-term problems from these type of seizures, but in the case of those about to turn on their offspring, it shows the biochemistry is shifting to become more aggressive as instant instincts are turned 180 degrees, and we will definitely get more in-depth with that here in a second. So Josh then goes outside and spots something with crows around it. He puts it in a box, and then he takes it to his dad's car. Now, I'm not too much of a Pontiac guy, but that is a pretty sweet 1979 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am. Now, typically, we were going to get a couple of engines available with this, but stock and standard versus the most powerful engine had a difference of around 50 horsepower. Judged by the burnouts Brent was doing earlier with the topless woman, I would have to say that he went with the 6.6 .6 400 cubic Pontiac V8 that would put out a fair amount of 220 horses, and that was a four-speed. The other engine was a 301 V8, putting out around 170 horsepower, but now, remember, 220 horsepower back in the day was actually pretty good. Now you can get 1,000 horsepower out of the Dodge Charger Hellcat Red Eye, I believe. Which, uh, I don't know how you just completely don't twist anything remotely attached to that engine at that point. But it's funny to watch the march of time because even my 1967 Impala with just an LS3 in it gets around 435 horsepower, which is plenty to end up fishtailing the back end out if I'm not careful. It's even easier in the rain. I know I'm not trying to die, uh, but <laughs> good lord. Anyways, so why Josh would choose the classic car to hide whatever he found in is beyond me. And that's why I keep my Impala completely locked up in the garage, because you never know when someone's going to lose touch with reality. So I have a theory, though. What I think is happening is the crows attacked one of their own. He grabbed it and then placed it in a box to get it away and was going to feed it, but it ended up meeting its end through pecking injuries, which would denote something rather interesting about what is going on and what is currently spreading. Now, if I am correct about this, it would mean the crows are also ganging up on their own young, which is pretty horrific, but there's a reason why. And this means all parents are turning against their offspring. And this would denote what is like the actual vector. It is suggested that it was a virus of sorts and the infection is spreading through a population. However, with other animals with completely different immune systems, genetics, and susceptibility to diseases, the overlap from crow to human in terms of infection is very small. Bird flu could be a potential suspect. However, this entire process happens at once. Because of that, I severely doubt 
this is actually the bird flu that jumped humans because nobody was exhibiting symptoms prior. Instead, I think this is a chemical attack. We can assume that if birds are affected like humans, this means anything that has the instinct to take care of their young is on the table. We know crows will often fly off to catch food, and after the eggs hatch, much like the mothers, the fathers will stay to help feed the nestlings, indicating that they have parental instinct just like humans do. From what we will see later with others, their instinctual drive hasn't developed yet, and as a result, they will not be infected. Again, I believe this supports the idea that this is a physical chemical that is altering the behavior of those exhibiting symptoms. But the question from here becomes, how exactly? So the garage door opens, the dad comes home and spots the animal. As they exchange words, there's a thudding noise as Lisa screams, and we now jump over to a call on me class. If you got that reference, then you are just as old as me. So then they get more coffee as they talk about trying to hold back father time, and that's why they exercise. And Jenna actually knows what's up. See, working out is great, but let's be real here. Partially, it's to make yourself look better. I live for the same reason. Well, that and I played a lot of Gears of War as a teenager. My mind subconsciously connected that the ones who survived were also built like literal meat tanks. So if you want to survive, you better be able to rep out 225 for a warm-up. I'm actually up to 250 now on bench. It's getting pretty lit. Hell yeah, brother. But anyhow, you look better, you feel better, you behave better, you have better interactions, and life in general is just better when you take care of your meat suit. Now, if you go overboard with it, yeah, it can be worse. So you have to kind of find that nice line there to enjoy your life and increase your self-confidence without turning into someone who's got like body dysmorphia and needs trend at the age of 21 because they think 800 test levels are low. Like, bro, get off the chemicals go natty. If there's anything I learned from my former father-in-law is that benching 400 and squatting 800 is awesome when you're 30, but when you hit 65 and all of your joints fuse together and you're in constant pain, uh, it's not really an ideal situation. Respect for Papa Hans for that information. So they keep talking about their offspring being younger than them and how they're angry about it, but that is in fact the march of time. Meanwhile, back at class, the teacher begins talking about planned obsolescence which is what we are actually, and also what our vehicles are. So advice time for Roanoke real quick as I dabble in cars, as you may have guessed. For the love of all that is holy on this planet, ignore dealerships and the nonsense you see that says, oh, change your oil every 10,000 miles. That will 100% absolutely destroy your car's engine. The oil they are using is so thin now, there's no shot it can last that long. Engines are still relatively the same as they've always been. You need to change your car's engine oil every three to 5,000 miles. If you don't learn anything else from this video, remember this. If they say it voids warranty or some bull crap like that, just go change it yourself every 5,000 miles and then take it back to the dealership so they can change it every 10,000 miles. And this is the perfect example of planned obsolescence. Changing your oil every 10,000 miles ensures it will wreck your engine not long after probably like 100,000 miles. And what's that? Oh, you need to buy another car? Sorry, looks like your engine just threw a rod on the road trip at 120k miles. My bad, you should have changed the oil like more regularly. Essentially, it's building and planning things for the future that are going to fail. So remember that. So as a species, we kind of have to do this as well, because much like the machines we build, we are temporary in these bodies. We replace ourselves because we are limited. It's instinctual. It's what we do. There are people out there who don't want offspring. Totally understandable. But it's more in line with reality that most people want to reproduce. So the teacher gets a call as one of the students gets called out. He then goes, gets another call as the police arrive. Another student then heads up as well. Over at the PSATs, or PSATs, I don't really know what you call them, the parents are standing outside waiting for their offspring, which is not concerning at all. So Carly and Riley are in the bathroom complaining about their parents, as one does, as things are about to start finally kicking off. Carly makes an exchange with a girl that comes in as the fire alarm then gets pulled and they walk out. Parents are trying to crawl over the fence as the cops grab them to hold them back. As Damon then finishes up his PSAT, parents are just, again, standing out there as they enter the door because he finally walked through. At this point, it's clear the cops know something, but nobody is saying anything. Very good. Keep everyone in the dark. Finally, one pre-adult loses it as his mom was freaking out and he crawls over the fence only to be immediately taken out by his own mother. This induces a panic as parents start going goblin mode and jumping over the fence to grab their own offspring. Truly, their redemption era has drawn to a close. Essentially, it's just a massive bloodlust. Students start getting taken out left, right, and center as the cops are trying to keep the parents away from their genetic prodigy as it becomes a game of keep away as well. As Damon rides home, he asks his neighbor about where Amanda is. I'm not really... Like, why are some people in school, but some aren't? It doesn't really make much sense to me. But she's like, oh, she's inside. Yeah, she definitely just took out her own daughter. Damon then enters the house and finds trash on the ground and starts complaining that his dad 
Uh, I guess it's probably drinking. And Damon also hears clattering noises all around him, but he just chooses to ignore it. Heading back inside, the TV is playing static as the dad begins to attack him. He breaks the bottle and then starts trying to take him out. But in the chaos, the dad slices his own neck after tripping and then bleeds out. Definitely hit the jugular on that one because there was really no pressure behind it. Ouchies. So again, we see that here, the static on the TVs, it has something to do with all of this. It's too much of a coincidence to just be something that happens for no reason. And as we continue to see, parents exposed to this frequency appear to immediately either turn or become violent. Almost like their brain is primed and they're just waiting for the frequency of noise brought on by the static to activate their almonds. We'll go more in depth in this potential here in a moment. So Kendall now realizes that Carly has been stealing from her and uh, she's pretty upset about it. Kendall goes to talk to, I assume is her previous employer, a print and new media design company or something. Although based on the way they're interacting, it seems like a little bit more than that. Her boss basically tells her no, and maybe she go get some classes first. Not really sure what this whole thing was for, but all right. So Kendall then gets a call from her sister as she's gone to labor, and then she almost gets hit by a cop car. Nice. So Riley and Carly then head to, I assume, Riley's house. And this is like a really nice house. So as Carly checks the news, parents have their jimmies rustled to the 10th degree and are absolutely taking out their offspring. Riley just ignores all this and goes upstairs and finds her mom. So now we meet the arbiter of information, Dr. Oz. I couldn't say that one with a straight face. Uh, he equates it to something known as savaging. It's when the parents will take out their own young for one reason or another. Usually it has to do with them, like, in nature, being sick or not being able to provide enough resources to keep them all alive. It's not usually noted in humans, however. Although postpartum depression is noted, which may lead to you taking out your offspring, but Carly then hears something as she goes upstairs calling out to Riley. As she does, she finds out Riley's been taken out by her own mother, but her mother's not really planning on attacking Carly. She's just like, oh, hey, honey. It's very odd. So now we get even more information. One man believes it's a neurotoxin of sorts, meant to take a similar pathway of the feeling of wanting prodigy and protecting those prodigy, except it corrupts the neural pathways into making parents want to harm rather than protect. To this end, they will annihilate the younger population systematically as their minds still work, but their parental instincts have been destroyed. And to understand parental instincts, we need to take a look at their physical circuitry behind it as that's the most important aspect. Which we tend to strangely believe, like I've always thought this was weird myself, but we separate ourselves from our brains. Like right now, for instance, I can gather that without my brain, I wouldn't be thinking. If my brain is damaged in some horrific way, I will have long lasting problems for essentially the rest of my life. But even as I think this, I feel somewhat separate from the meat that's actually in my head. Well, meat and fat. A lot of people report the same feeling, like somehow their thoughts don't seem to originate from their head. Now, why would a brain think this? It's itself, right? It's a good question, but it's important to remember concerning neurology, it really doesn't matter what you think the thoughts are in your head or if they're there or not. Physical alterations to the brain will have consequences. Without getting too deep into the neurology behind it, it is important to understand the physical changes to the brain as well as the hormonal ones. Within the brain, we have discussed the increase and decrease in gray matter concerning the amygdala and orbital frontal cortex respectively. But there are many other areas. For instance, thalamus, frontal cortex, and brainstem are activated to cues put out by younglings to behave in a certain way that is beneficial to the offspring. To this end, we can begin to understand why the shift in regards towards their own becomes horrific. Many things parents do is completely outside of their control. It is instinctual. It's sort of like breathing or blinking, both of which you're now doing manually. You perform these actions without thinking about it, except for right now. If these were somehow altered, you would begin to perform the action without thinking about it, which you may say, well, Roanoke, that sounds pretty stupid, but we do it all the time right now. For instance, let's say some traumatic event has happened in your past. You meet up with somebody, fall in love, and begin living with one another. Over time, however, despite you believing that you are behaving normally, they will come to you and say, hey man, this ain't working because of X, Y, Z, which were all things that were maladaptive traits that you developed to deal with traumatic times in your life. While those may have been normal, for you at least, and nothing was tipping off your brain there, they were still an issue to another as it's clear as day. The brain functioning in what it deems normal will absolutely not concern you or impact you unless you are forced to change those behaviors. In this way, we see how the parents may be going after their own offspring. During one interview, a man is remarking about how logically he knows what he did was wrong. However, it felt completely right, which highlights the circuitry of the brain in specific areas has changed to become more aggressive towards their own. 
Parental behaviors are stored in the brain. And within these areas, again, the limbic system, which is responsible for a lot of emotions and instincts, as you can call them, would be largely affected by this alteration. Instead of emotion of love and instinct to protect, it could be as simple as a decrease in activation in these areas through a neurotransmitter blocker or an increase in a specific hormone to the point it overwhelms the system, creating new responses to functional instincts. The brain knows there's an issue, but the emotional control center is overwhelmed by the absolute chaos taking place in the limbic system involved parental instincts. The first sign of this is a zone out seizure. As we all know, a seizure is a mass firing of neurons, which essentially is just noise to the brain. Depending on how many neurons are incorporated or where the seizure is originating from, it can cause more or less issues. The limbic system is, I believe, experiencing this seizure, altering the behavior of the parent, causing them to be aggressive. Because remember, that much activity in a neuron can actually cause the brain to enter a depressive state after it has been somewhat depleted. However, there are other areas that are likely going to exhibit this seizure, and this causes a person to have less emotional control than normal. The frontal cortex, already lacking gray matter due to reproducing, has now become more encumbered by a seizure, allowing for thought to still be present, but control to be lessened. But I still believe there is an endocrine system point to all of this, which we will go in depth here once we see more examples. So at the hospital, Jeannie starts giving birth to her youngling. As they hand her her infant, she immediately starts hugging it way too hard. It becomes a fight to get it away from her, at this point, as Kendall is able to grab her away, but the mom continues trying to attack. Still though, the TV in the background went static. It seems like, again, something else is going on. Meanwhile, Carly takes off running as she spots other parents who have taken out their prodigy and freaks out before running into Damon. But again, those parents didn't really care because they did not have this connection with Carly. They're just not interested in interacting with her. Meanwhile, at Brent's office, he wakes up hearing his phone. He turns a picture over of his offspring and immediately starts screaming. So Kendall finally gives up the youngling as the other parents keep staring at their newborns. The hospital at this point is probably not a great place to be at at all. Kendall then calls home and talks to the housekeeper as Damon and Carly agree to go in, grab Josh, and get out. Carly talks to Soon Yi, but it becomes apparent she is mopping with her daughter's blood. Carly then finds Josh hiding upstairs as he heard something happen to Lisa. Carly insists he leave with her as Soon Yi then packs her car and heads out. But as soon as she does that, Brent comes home finding Damon in the house. Damon watches an interview with one of the parents where he says he knows what he did was wrong, but it felt exactly right. Brent then talks, like asks Damon what he's doing there. Brent then mimics Damon's voice about why they need to talk. And Brent is a bit of a douche, but his aggression levels in general are higher at this point as he is fully succumbing to his instinctual drives being corrupted. Josh comes down and says, Dad, as Brent then launches an attack trying to take them out. He knocks out Damon as Carly and Josh flee into the basement. We also get this scene with a pool table that Brent was building three weeks earlier. Kendall snuck up on him and she was angry that he bought it. But Brent is kind of right. He launches in how maybe there needs to be boundaries. A youngling area, which is the rest of the house, and an area for adults, which is the basement. I mean, I can't really fault him for that. It's important to retain some form of independence when you have kids. Otherwise, you will lose yourself entirely, usually through the loss of uh, gray matter. So Brent has a freak out and then breaks down the pool table. Ah, life. You never know which direction it'll take you. They have a talk about what they used to be, like that. Well, we were Brent and Kendall, and now we're just mom and dad. And I mean, I suppose, but I mean, I don't know. I don't have younglings yet, but my philosophy could change, but it kind of seems worth it to me. So as Kendall drives home, someone pushes whoo, a stroller in front of her, brutal, and she just totally annihilates that one. A radio broadcast then tells her not to go near the prodigy, as this seems like some sort of infection and you will attack them. So then we get this god-awful tinnitus noise indicating Kendall has become infected. And this noise, I believe, is imperative to understanding what's happening. First, the static that is sent out. At first, it doesn't really make sense unless you approach this movie with an understanding that this is a coordinated event. Have you ever been sitting there and everything goes quiet for a second and then you get the ringing noise? Do you know what that is? Well, essentially inside of your ears, there's a signal that starts amplifying itself and building upon itself, which is then transmitted to your neurons. It takes your brain a few seconds to realize this as then it calms those neurons down. It is a self-amplifying signal that your body has to disrupt, which is why it goes away after a few seconds. To me, it's clear the static on the TV does something, but only after you've already been exposed. I believe this to be a neurotoxin of sorts, one that alters the behavior of the limbic system through posing as something similar to a parent hormone known as prolactin. 
In normal levels, prolactin helps mothers and fathers actually bond with their offspring by making them positively react to things that people who haven't bonded to offspring might find annoying. Mothers have it pretty much from day one as when the offspring is born from them, but the father's prolactin levels will rise over the ensuing days as he bonds with his offspring as well. Now this hormone is all well and good, but there are other stabilizing hormones associated with it like oxytocin for instance, but prolactin helps an adult respond positively to like a crying youngling rather than get annoyed, whereas, you know, that's pretty much what most of us do. So hence why a screaming offspring may be annoying to you, someone who doesn't actually have one of their own, but to another parent, they may respond with a concern in a calmer manner because they have elevated levels of prolactin. So how would more of this be a bad thing? Well, really high levels of prolactin, much like too much of a good thing of anything is a bad thing, will cause someone to be aggressive towards everyone. But in this case, they target their offspring. It is well known in males that too high of levels of prolactin will cause them to become hostile in general, and the same can be said during postpartum aggression seen in mothers. Because we know the crows are likely not exposed to some random TV signal or infotainment center, we can assume then that this may likely be an airborne neurotoxin that takes those with offspring no matter the age and raises their prolactin levels to potentially detrimental points making them hostile and corrupting their parental instincts. And those who have not reproduced yet, we see they normally will have lower levels anyhow, and these levels may also rise, but not to the point of becoming dangerous. It also needs to be understood that there is a level of connection that needs to be accounted for. With prolactin levels high and hostility rising, the limbic system may be in a depressed state, resulting from their seizures. It appears parents will attack anyone that gets in their way, so a level of familiarity needs to be included, which may mean areas of like memory associations, such as the prefrontal cortex are also involved. Memories of a person may create the incorrect input, corrupting the output, turning the person more hostile. So as deep as the love was, that's how deep the hatred is now. And considering most parents would very likely sacrifice their own life without question for their offspring, the same level of hatred can be applied, meaning they would go after the one connection that they have, except it's reversed. So you can consider it this way. Going back to the one man who said it was wrong, but it feels right. If you could somehow talk to the dead, it's likely a parent would tell you that sacrificing themselves for their offspring was 100% the move because of its instinctual drive. You don't think about it, it just feels right. Now that it's been reversed due to corruption present in the limbic system, you have the ability to ask a living parent if they feel like it was the right thing to do. They would feel content due to the high levels of prolactin and really whatever this neurotoxin is, it's inducing the same effects. Now, there's gonna be people in the comments who are like, oh, I'm completely safe. This is basically just the generalized take of what parents are supposed to do. There's a lot of crappy parents out there, just as a heads up, but even if they are crappy, they might still feel this way about you. So anyways, as Kendall walks in, she finds Brent on the ground unconscious. She wakes him up and he tells her they're in the basement. She calls out to them as Carly admits to stealing money. As Kendall tells them to come out of the basement, Brent then starts going goblin mode on the door, telling them to open it. Again, increased hostility and aggression in males. High prolactin. Kendall now goes to get some tools. As a saws all, saws all, the dad goes for his force multiplier as Josh fires around through the door, hitting Kendall in the arm. Ironically, they talk about how they could have injured, this could have injured the younglings, which is exactly what they are trying to do. A disconnect between logical and emotional areas of the brain are clearly shown here. They then dump alcohol on her arm and try to clean the wound. So at this point, they decide to try to gas the offspring out of the basement. Also, Damon has been unconscious for a really long time. I know in movies and stuff, it's like you get punched and you wake up several hours later. If you wake up several hours after being punched and knocked out, you have brain damage. Anyways, running a hose to the window, they turn on the gas and they begin sealing up the door. Kendall tells Brent that she found Lisa in a trash can. <laughs> so as they sit there waiting for the gas to do its work, Josh is having issues breathing, which it's been several hours at this point. I'm pretty sure this would have been a lot quicker, but uh, then again, I've never been gassed out of a home before. So Carly talks to Josh and then tells her the parents want to take them out. Carly now goes and looks for a way out. Opening the air return vent, she realizes that they can crawl their way out of there. So setting up a trap, she uses matches that will strike when they open the door, igniting the room. Heading to the return vent, the parents start trying to saws all the door. Kendall goes and grabs a meat tenderizer as Carly and Josh crawl out as Brent opens the door, igniting the room, blasting them back in a slow motion, which was hilarious. Your hearing is in no way going to recover from that one. 
As Kendall wakes back up, Brent is moving a little slower. She goes down into the basement and finds the younglings are gone, but she hears them upstairs. Where is the force multiplier? Kendall then spots them as she runs after and it becomes a nice game of keep away. Meanwhile, we have a flashback to when Carly was younger and Kendall found her using her makeup. Ah, parental bonding. Now that's done, or at minimum corrupted. As Kendall launches her attack on Carly, Damon finally wakes back up. Again, this man definitely has brain damage as he helps keep Kendall away from Carly. They then wrap her up and put her in the closet and they're able to hold her back as they start laughing for some reason as Josh comes in asking where his mom is. She catches Damon through the cheek, but it's not lethal. However, she smacks Damon in the head with a meat tenderizer as he falls, literally two stories hitting everything on the way down, which somehow does not take this man out. So Mr. Sawzall approaches saying Saul's all, but before he can attack, there's a ring at the doorbell. It's Brent's parents. He opens the door going, Mom, Dad, I can explain, and immediately gets pepper sprayed and then stabbed. His dad is experiencing the same problem. Grandpa's happy to see his grand offspring, but he's not happy to see his own offspring. This is interesting as it denotes there needs to be a long-established connection reliant on the offspring-parent bond. While grandparents can feel strongly towards their grandkids, the reality is uh, they will never be as strong as a parent's. It's just not hormonally possible. However, with their own offspring, they will still have that bond as now it has been corrupted. Kendall at this point starts having what appears to be a breakthrough with her brain working again as she tries to tell her mom or her mother-in-law not to attack Brent. So she yells Kendall's not even a real name as then we get another flashback. Brent is talking to his son about how he messed up in the past as well. He crashed the Trans Am, he totaled the car while he was doing the whole topless thing, and he had to pay back his old man the damages and rebuild the car. At the end of it, he kept the car. The mom wants him to sell the car, but he refuses. Yeah, I'd be the exact same way. I was told to sell a few of my cars or not get any more. Hmm. Lame. So Brent actually starts destroying his own car to get to Josh, which shows that their bloodlust actually has a blinding effect on them. And it's sort of like a great white shark eating. They don't really know what they're eating. They're just biting. So as Brent's father then starts stabbing him in the hamstrings, that looks painful. So we have to stop here for a second. What was the deal with Kendall? This breakthrough is only done when her offspring is out of the room and she can think logically. This is immediately over once she spots Carly later on. And this means visual input with the optic nerve running past the limbic system is causing this feeling. And it's sort of like the feeling you get when you see someone after a really long time that you love. You can feel the emotions and feel the memories and it makes you feel good, right? Well, it's working backwards upon spotting Carly, making her become more aggressive, which then overrides her logical thinking. So Josh almost gets crushed at this point as Kendall then takes out the grandmother, or does she? Kendall has lost touch with reality and she now goes after Carly, but before she can take her out, the grandmother attacks as Brent runs over his own mother and dad, who is then taken out in the ensuing crash, leaving Kendall and Brent still up. Somehow, Damon survived with basically no injuries that would have been life-threatening, as then he knocks out Kendall. I'm assuming Brent got knocked out in the crash. So the parents then wake up in the basement tied to the support pole as they ask to be let free. They then have a freak out trying to escape, which alerts the younglings they're still violent, and Josh says he loves them as the parents say they love them too, but sometimes it just makes them want to and then it cuts out, and I'm assuming kill them. And thus concludes Mom and Dad. So first, we can assume that this is a neurotoxin of sorts that appears to be airborne as it affects all species that form parental bonds as seen with the crows. We can assume other animals experience the same thing. This may mean the prolactin levels increase to detrimental levels as the neurotoxin itself is filling in, attaching to probably similar receptors that the prolactin would. This induces seizures in key areas as well as in the limbic system with the frontal lobe probably having its functionality altered to boot. But the one thing we haven't been able to really solve, what is that static? This is why I believe it is a coordinated event. With the crows not being near technology, but the humans being near it, it says to me potentially due to our larger cerebrum and ability to think that static for humans, it's something that puts our brain in a vulnerable state to amplify the effects of the neurotoxin. This could be easily done at once, creating seizures in areas that may be sensitive to the signal and thus allowing for the neurotoxin to work more effectively. And animals who run off instinct anyhow, and I mean, while being smart, crows in no way compared to man's intelligence, the neurotoxin by itself works, but really they're just caught in the crossfire of what is being released onto man. But you have to ask yourself, who does this really benefit? Well, obviously there are quite a few humans on this planet and with humans come warring factions. So what better way to cripple another country than to take out its replacements? The amount of younger life that would be lost would be far reaching and have worse implications later. Just look at Russia's generational wave after World War II. They are still feeling the effects of it now and have not back up. By taking out a large portion of the younger population, this would ensure your enemy's defeat 
in just a few decades as 40 year olds will be 70. And even then you have the grandparents who may even luck out and take out some of their 40 year olds. So even if they reproduced again, the loss of functionality to a country and the knowledge that could be passed along would be devastating to a population. So personally, I believe this is a coordinated attack used to destabilize an entire country through an airborne neurotoxin, using the static as a way to help induce seizures in the brain to help decrease the chance of a person logically overriding the parental instinct corruption. But anyhow, I want to hear what you guys think. I know apparently you weren't supposed to look that deep into it, but honestly, it's an interesting thought experiment as to why these things happen if they did. If you enjoyed, then leaving a like would be great and subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on when I post. We're actually approaching a million subs, so that is awesome. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, Roanoke Tales, and merch links in the description. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astronaut, the Soviet robot. Thank you, man. I'd also like to thank our astrophysicist, Death Dancer, as well as our scientists, Chad the Enjoyer of Scientific Explanations B-Grade Horror Movies, Dakota 23, Florian, Lucian Dragon, Octavia Serpentia, and the last final girl on the left. Thank you very much. And the rest of my patrons, I thank you as well. Your help goes 100% like a long way towards keeping this channel afloat. It is greatly appreciated. And don't forget to use my Raid Shadow Legends link in the description or scan my QR code to get insane bonuses for new players with awesome champions. But that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed. Have a happy new year, and I'll see y'all in the next one.